Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. Let's do another reaction video, shall we? I thought it would be fun to react to something a little different. Since I've done a bunch of reactions to like Stalin videos, I thought I'd do one on Trotsky, just see what it is like on the uh, other side. Since mainstream capitalist propaganda generally is much more favorable towards Trotsky than towards Lenin or Stalin. Albeit obviously not entirely favorable, since Trotsky presented himself as a Marxist. I want to do some of these reaction videos mainly just to have some variety on my channel. I've been putting out almost exclusively like scripted videos that are full of like citations and quotes from books and whatnot. And it's uh, very labor intensive to make them. So it's really difficult to have the time to put them out consistently. And I think they can also be a bit more dry and dense. Although the one thing that annoys me about making these is that every now and then something comes up and I haven't researched it beforehand, so I might get something wrong. And that's annoying. That's why ideally I would research every single thing beforehand. But whenever I get something wrong, it is annoying. So I'll try to be more careful in the future. Like in one of my Lenin videos, I said that the Tsar's family was taken to Ryazan, but that was wrong. They were taken to Ekaterinburg, which later became Sverdlovsk. Not that that matters, you know, who cares? Like, it's just, I got the name of the city wrong, but still, you know, it's annoying. And when they said that um, Bolsheviks used chemical weapons against the uh, Antonov's rebellion, which was sort of a Kulak uh, uprising against war communism, I said that the Bolsheviks didn't use chemical weapons, which is true, but my explanation of it was still wrong, because it turns out that uh, the Bolsheviks did plan to use tear gas, but I think it wasn't very effective, and not to mention tear gas is not considered a chemical weapon, so that's the real story, but I really kind of want to do a whole dedicated video about the Antonov's Rebellion, but enough of that, let's get to the actual substance of this video. A man in exile is writing in his study. He is interrupted by a Stalinist agent who has broken into his home armed with an ice axe. The pair struggle before the agent drives the ads of the axe into the man's skull, and he dies the following day. According to at least some sources, Trotsky was not killed by a GPU agent, but he was killed by an ex-Trotskyist. A man who had previously been an anarchist, briefly became a Trotskyist, then discovered that Trotsky and his cronies in Mexico were basically a bunch of losers. He became extremely disappointed, extremely angry at them. He then proceeds to kill Trotsky. The reason that I think that's very plausible is that there was never any evidence of the man being a Soviet agent. There is another story that once he got out of prison after a very long prison sentence, he went to the Soviet Union and secretly received a Soviet medal for killing Trotsky. The problem with that story is that this allegedly happened secretly, so nobody would know about it. So it was so secret that it's difficult to tell if it even happened at all. As I said, I'll put some sources in the description for those who want to get more into this uh, issue of Trotsky's uh, killing. Another reason that makes me think that's a very plausible story is that uh, Trotsky's whole group were very depressed, demoralized. Trotsky's son, Sedov, had become an alcoholic. And think about it. The state of world Trotskyism at that point was rather poor. There was only Trotsky's small group in Mexico and the few rich liberals in the US who gave him money, handful of individuals in other countries... And I happen to know that Trotsky's son went to Czechoslovakia and Hungary to try to create Trotsky's parties there, and he failed because he couldn't get enough people to organize any kind of group. He was not born with the name by which he is popularly known, but was actually called Lev Davidovich Bronstein. Yes, he was called Lev Davidovich Bronstein, that is correct. All the revolutionaries had a fake name. For obvious reasons, they were undercover revolutionaries. New political groupings began to emerge in this more permissive political environment. For instance, Mikhail Bakunin founded modern collectivist anarchism in Russia in the mid-19th century. Other groups, such as the Emancipation of Labour Party and the Narodniks, argued for socialism in Russia. Yeah, so already in the early 1800s, and especially in the mid-1800s, there arose a movement which we Marxists nowadays tend to call the revolutionary democratic movement. Some of the earliest notable figures in the revolutionary democratic movement were Vissarion Belinsky and Nikolai Dobrolyubov. But in the mid-1800s, the movement became much bigger, and there were leaders such as Heltsen and Chernyshevsky, who inspired both the utopian socialist terrorists known as Narodniks and the Russian Marxists. 
the revolutionary democrats were socialists, materialists, a lot of them even studied dialectics, and some of them were familiar with at least parts of Marxism, but they were not yet fully Marxist, and they were also not uh, fully dialectical materialist, even though they did attempt to utilize both dialectics and materialism. Uh, there was obviously also a big liberal reform movement, which would have preferred to replace uh, Tsarist autocracy with a constitutional monarchy. The Emancipation of Labor group was the first Marxist group in Russia. It was founded by a group led by Girgi Plehanov. The group, in Lenin's words, was the first to spread the theoretical principles of Marxism to Russia, and Plehanov wrote many important theoretical works, but the group did not yet have any uh, ties to the working class. They were not able to create a party or start any kind of uh, big movement. They eventually had to go into exile to avoid political persecution. That was in the 1880s, 1890s. In the 1890s, Lenin begins his revolutionary career and uh, founds the St. Petersburg League of Struggle for the Emancipation of Working Class. And that became the first Marxist group to have actual ties to the masses and start an actual Marxist uh, working class movement. The Emancipation of Labour Party and the Narodniks argued for socialism in Russia in the 1870s and 1880s following the political ideas of the German political theorist Karl Marx. Yeah, that's not really true. The Narodniks were not such big fans of Marxism. They disagreed with Marx about the most basic things. The Narodniks were the main competitors against Marxism, and while Marxists thought that industrialization was good and uh, they wanted industrialization to create a modern working class, which was then overthrow the Tsar and then overthrow capitalism, the Narodniks instead thought that um, they need to commit terrorist attacks against the government to make the government uh, topple, then they can get rid of the landlords and they can restore the basically medieval village community, which they considered contained... Uh, something which could be developed into agrarian socialism. So while the Marxists wanted history to go forward, the Narodniks basically wanted history to go backward. Marxist economics were so influential that some Narodniks and, you know, even anarchists and whatnot, other people, were influenced by Marxist economics, but they tried to twist them and distort them to suit their own ends, and that's why uh, they basically turned it into gibberish, and they tried to argue against uh, the various conclusions that Marxist analysis led to. You know, famously, if you read, like, Lenin's uh, on the so-called market question, he talks about the disagreement between Marxists and Narodniks, where Narodniks claim that Russia is simply unable to develop capitalism because of, supposedly, the market doesn't exist and cannot come into existence, etc., etc. I'm not going to go into all the details, there's too many of them. In 1902, Lenin had published a pamphlet entitled What is to be done? which opened up a wide-ranging and divisive debate within the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party over the future of the party. On the one side were purists such as Lenin, who believed that the party should build its support exclusively around the industrial working class, while a separate faction argued that the party should seek the support of the middle class against the Tsarist government and the upper class of Russia. That's entirely wrong. I don't know where that comes from. His, <laughs> that Lenin is a purist? So many times, as another false uh, criticism, people have argued the entire opposite. They've said that, oh, Lenin wanted to unite uh, with the bourgeois. And the reality is that in what is to be done, and you can verify this by simply reading the thing, Lenin says that, yes, they need to have a revolution against the Tsarist autocracy to overthrow the remnants of feudalism in Russia. This revolution, Marxism calls uh, a bourgeois democratic revolution because... Bourgeois democratic revolutions are revolutions that overthrow feudalism. So Lenin says, yes, we need to carry out a bourgeois democratic revolution. However, in Russia, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, they are too weak, too reactionary. They want to unite with the feudal landowners and the Tsarist government because the capitalist class is more afraid of the workers than of Tsarism. The capitalists don't want a revolution. They only want to reform Tsarism a little bit. So he says that they need to carry out a bourgeois democratic revolution, but it should be led by the working class, not by the capitalists. Now, this was a little different than what has been said before, because in earlier bourgeois democratic revolutions, such as uh, the French Revolution of 1789, that was led by the rising capitalist class, the rising bourgeoisie. But Lenin argued that the capitalists have become an entirely reactionary class, while in the past they had a certain progressive role to play because they opposed feudalism, they created industry, and they made society progress. Well, these days they don't really do that anymore, and the best example of that was Russia. 
so yes, in that sense, Lenin said that they need to get support from the workers because the revolution must be led by the workers and supported by the peasantry. While the Mensheviks, Lenin's opponents, they said that uh, the bourgeois democratic revolution should be carried out under the leadership of the bourgeoisie. And that's because the Mensheviks themselves were dogmatic, kind of blockheads. They didn't understand that the situation was now different. That's why some people actually say that Mensheviks were the purists, because they were such uh, dogmatists in certain aspects, although in other aspects they were complete uh, revisionists. All that being said, in what is to be done, Lenin actually says that in the democratic revolution, they need to unite everybody, all the struggles that are against the Tsar, they need to unite all of them. He says, minority nationalities, minority religions, which are all persecuted by the Tsar, unite with the peasantry, with soldiers who are oppressed by the Tsarist military bureaucracy, they need to unite with the progressive students, and he says uh, in a number of texts from this period, that, yes, they even should support the liberal bourgeois opposition against the Tsar in certain individual cases at least. So if the liberal bourgeois reformers want to change some law, and by doing that they would give the workers more democratic rights, more right to express their views, more right to propagate their views, then the Bolsheviks should support that because it benefits them. So Lenin wasn't any kind of uh, sectarian who said that, uh, no, we shouldn't unite with anybody. No, he said we should unite with absolutely everybody that we can, as long as they do something that needs to happen. But, you know, Lenin has always stressed that all alliances are conditional and temporary, so obviously, you know, the liberals, they can maybe get one good thing done, but at the end of the day, they're still liberals, so you shouldn't really trust them, and their usefulness is extremely limited, uh, etc., etc. But let's keep going, or otherwise we'll be here all day. The Bolsheviks, headed by Lenin, had the support of only a minority of the party membership. Bolshevik newspapers were funded by huge amounts of workers, while the Menshevik newspapers were funded by only a small handful of rich people. Trotsky's initial response to this split in the party was to affiliate himself with the Mensheviks. However, by the autumn of 1904, he had become increasingly disillusioned with the Mensheviks' excessive courting of Russian liberals and the Russian middle class. As a result, he removed himself from affiliation with both the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. This is pretty much true. Trotsky first aligned with the Mensheviks against Bolshevism, then he leaves the Mensheviks and he creates his own uh, various groups. And Trotsky's whole thing during this period of about 10 plus years is that he claims that the split in the party between Menshevism and Bolshevism is basically pointless, and he doesn't take a stand in this uh, split. And even when the First World War starts, which for many was a decisive moment, even many Mensheviks, such as Kolontai for instance, finally left the Menshevik party and joined the Bolsheviks, because the Bolsheviks were the anti-war party. But even that didn't convince Trotsky. Trotsky was like, no, this split doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, like, what people think about the war. That's why Lenin calls Trotsky a Kautskyite during the war. That's why there was this paradoxical situation where Trotsky was leading his own tiny splinter fraction or was working with a, a number of these tiny fractions. One of the most notorious ones was the August Bloc, where he tried to unite a big group of uh, different fractions, which all had wildly different ideas such as the uh, liquidators, who wanted to get rid of the underground party apparatus completely, the Otsavis, who wanted to get rid of the legal party apparatus, but only keep the underground party apparatus, and also uh, the Jewish Labor Bund, which was like a sort of a ethno-separatist uh, organization, and various other groups. Trotsky wanted to unite all these fragments to fight against Lenin, which demonstrates just how unprincipled he was. That's why Lenin always said that Trotsky is so unprincipled, because he he's trying to unite with these people who don't have any common ground on anything except being anti-Lenin. But it leads into this paradoxical situation where Trotsky always says that he's for unity, he's for unity, because he doesn't take a stand on any of these splits. But in reality, he still only leads his own small, tiny fraction. So even though he's a fractionalist, he claims that he's actually the only one who's not a fractionalist. It's kind of ironic, like he's a fractionalist based on being against fractions. Obviously, the whole problem with such an approach is that you can't just unite with people who don't agree with you on anything, because such unity is entirely fake. 
And actually, it gets even more ironic than that, because even Plehanov, the main leader of the Mensheviks, and a number of his supporters had also realized that they actually need to unite with Lenin, they need to define their disagreements, and they need to define their agreements, and they need to start by purging the party of the absolutely worst kinds of opportunists, who are the liquidators and the Otsevists. But Trotsky said that, no, no, we need to unite with these opportunists, you know, if the leaders of both the big groups, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, they both think, okay, yeah, we should do this, but Trotsky still insists, no, 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 you see, I'm the one who is for unity, even though I'm against both the big groups. It's pretty ridiculous. So this is what Lenin says on the topic. He says, quote, It is in this that the enormous difference lies between real partyism, which consists in purging the party of liquidationism and Otsavism, and the conciliation of Trotsky and company, which actually renders the most faithful service to the liquidators and Otsavists, and is therefore an evil that is all the more dangerous to the party, the more cunningly, artfully, and rhetorically it cloaks itself with professedly pro-party, professedly anti-factional declamations. Unquote. He again put his literary abilities to work and began writing for various underground newspapers associated with the Mensheviks. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Even though Trotsky said that he's not part of Menshevism, maybe technically he wasn't part of the Menshevik organization, but he still was ideologically more closely aligned to them, and he mostly worked with them. That's why when the Mensheviks held the St. Petersburg Soviet, Trotsky was put as the head of the Menshevik Soviet. Councils or Soviets of non-elected workers established to represent the workers of the capital's factories. I don't know why he says that they were non-elected. He's trying to make it seem like it was some kind of anti-democratic thing, but the Soviets were basically delegate assemblies. So each factory, each location, they choose a delegate from amongst themselves. So yes, they vote, okay, which one of us gets to be the delegate? Then they send that guy as their delegate to represent them in uh, the Soviet meeting. Here he became involved from 1908 onwards with the Russian Marxist and psychoanalyst Adolf Joff in the publication of an underground Russian language newspaper, Pravda. Not to be confused with the Bolshevik newspaper also called Pravda. These writings outline Trotsky's views on permanent revolution, his singular contribution to Marxist theory. I don't know, the thing about permanent revolution is that when you ask different Trotskyist groups or even individual Trotskyists what permanent revolution means, they always characterize it differently. The theory of permanent revolution has become most famous or most infamous because of the claim that socialism cannot be built in a single country, but socialism has to be built in at least all the leading European powers simultaneously. However, Trotsky only started advocating that position in the 1920s. While in the early 1900s, Lenin took issue with Trotsky's characterization of the permanent revolution theory because the theory at the time claimed that the peasantry was reactionary and that the peasantry could only be relied on in the bourgeois democratic revolution, but not in the socialist revolution. And it's funny how Trotskyism always tries to take credit for the October Revolution, because Lenin called for the overthrow of the provisional government, and Trotsky also called for the overthrow of the provisional government, hence they claim Lenin was actually taking Trotsky's advice, which is entirely false. But the October Revolution was carried out by the workers and peasants, so it even contradicts Trotsky's uh, entire argument. Una's Trotskyism was distinctive from Marxism in stressing the need for permanent revolution and support for social revolution in the more advanced capitalist countries. Trotskyism actually was not different from uh, Menshevism or dogmatic, outdated Marxism or from the Marxism of the Second International in that sense because all the dogmatists, they all thought that uh, revolution had to happen in the most advanced countries first. So that wasn't something that Trotsky uniquely came up with. No, that was just the typical thing to believe. It was only Lenin and the Bolsheviks who had the foresight to question that. That also raises the question, how the hell does the October Revolution fit with permanent revolution, since Trotsky believed that the revolution should happen in the most advanced countries first, and Russia was not one of those countries. In fact, that became sort of a crisis situation for Trotsky. That is why Trotsky thought that if the revolution doesn't happen in Germany, then the Russian Revolution is doomed. That is what Trotsky's theory claims. Well, the problem is, the theory didn't fit reality. The German Revolution didn't happen, so Trotsky was kind of, you know, being straightjacketed by this theory, he was kind of in a dead end. 